Good morning, guys. Welcome out to Revolution. So it's morning here in Australia, about seven o'clock in the morning. And we have Will Kinney all the way from Colorado. So we're going to do an interview with Will. And we're going to be talking about the King James Version, which is a very popular topic. So we've already got a bunch of people watching. Uh, a lot of people were waiting um, in the wait room. And so, um, Will, how are you going? How's how's Colorado the, this morning or this evening or this afternoon? Yeah, Whatever. it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's a pretty nice day. It's probably about 60 degrees, and it's pretty nice. Yeah, spring is starting to come. Oh, that's good. That's great. Yeah, we're entering into autumn here, so the weather's getting cooler. Ah. And so um, very. it's interesting having a hot summer Christmas here because – Everyone's yeah. singing jingle bells and talking about snow, and it doesn't relate to us at all. But um, we're going to do a, a an interview with uh, Will Kinney. So, Will Kinney, if you don't know who Will Kinney is and you are involved with the King James Version debates, um, Textus Receptus, um, critical text, majority text, all that sort of stuff, if you don't know who Will Kinney is, well, you are illiterate when it comes to the Bible version issue. Will Kinney is prolific in writing material. Now, I'll just let you know how I know Will. Um, I started becoming interested in King James issues, and I was basically like a TR sort of guy because to be King James only, you're in a cult, so you, you avoid that label. <laughs> we wear the TR T-shirt, and I'd jump on these forums back in 2002. Um, the King James Only Controversy Forum with um, Scott Jones was on there and a whole bunch of other people, and Logos uh, 1560 was on there, who I think is Rick Joyner. Rick and That's Rick Norris, I think. Rick Norris, okay. Uh, and so we, I'd jump on there and I'd type in a few things and, and I started reading Will's material and um, Scott Jones's material. And eventually that turned me from having a New King James. So I, I, I was reading the New King James thinking it's just an update of the old. But um, Will was diligent to point out all the issues. And I'd argue back and forward with him. He probably can't really remember that. That's no. <laughs> 22 years ago. And it was instrumental in guiding me. Uh, toward um, the position that I have today. And so um, when I started my Texas Receptor site, Will kindly allowed me to uh, upload his articles on there. So I was able to put Will's articles on there. And so a lot of I've had a lot of hits through people reading Will's material. And um, so that's how I know Will. And so maybe... Um, Maybe, Will, you can introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you do with yourself, and um, and we'll just start moving on from there. Well, I'm a retired uh, high school Spanish teacher, of all things. I've never been to seminary, for which I thank God. <laughs> uh, I did go take a class in Greek, and that got me kind of started, at least with the basic tools, and then I kind of picked up. Uh, Greek, so I can read New Testament Greek. Um, I've been a Christian for a long time. Uh, I was a hippie back in the in the '60s, and I was not brought up in a Christian home. Uh, they would go to church occasionally, and like on Christmas and Easter, maybe. And uh, when I got into college, the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado, well, the hippie movement was just starting. 1965 around there and I went in head over heels and uh, so I did a lot of drugs and a lot of psychedelics and things and that led me off into Eastern religion and I got deeply involved in Eastern religions and uh, I started studying them a lot and meditating and uh, yoga and I Ching and just about everything imaginable Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and um, so I was into all that stuff and then uh, I picked up the Bible and I started reading parts of it because it was another religious book. And then I read a section that said, uh, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And that just kind of hit me. But still not hard enough. And uh, 
I was just hiking around the country and I went up to uh, uh, one of some of the Jesus communes at this time. And this was up in uh, Oregon. And I stopped off there and they let me stay. And I was the next morning I woke up and I'm swinging a pendulum over my food, you know, to try to get the, the good vibes. Is it going to be good for me or not? <laughs> and I was doing some yoga. And the guy saw me. <laughs> So he brought me back into a uh, back room and he opened up the Bible and uh, started talking to me. And I don't know what he said, but there was one verse he was reading, I think, out of First Timothy. And it's talked about in end times, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud. But he came to a verse that said, uh, ever, le ever learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. That verse just, bam, it just hit me like a brick in the forehead. And I started reading again, and I had I realized that if if Jesus is the more I read, I saw that you know he's exclusive. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I realized that uh, I either had to reject all of my Eastern religions and kind of I like this part and that part of this and Hinduism and that part of Buddhism and I'll put them together, or I had to reject all of that and accept Jesus Christ as being the only truth. And that's what happened. I was again hitchhiking around the country and I happened to find a Bible track on the ground. And this young guy and his wife were just starting a ministry among college students in the University of uh, Northern Colorado up in Greeley. And had an address and I went over and they invited me to stay for dinner. And that, that night they're going through the Bible study in Romans and uh, you know, he, he was explaining the gospel and he asked me, do you believe this? And I said, you know, I do. And that's when I became a Christian. And uh, well, I went on pretty strong for about seven years, doing really well. And I actually felt the call of God to go to South America uh, to help yeah. out down there with some, uh, some of the Brethren Assemblies and uh, Plymouth Brethren, you might call them. And I was down there. Things were going pretty well for a while. <laughs> And then I just totally wiped out. I just was bombarded by unbelievable temptations and things. And I, I was in a bad state. I backslid pretty seriously for about seven years. And then God miraculously turned my life around again. And that's been over 40 years now ago. So the last wow. 40 years have been great, uh, just any, by comparison. But God taught me a lot through that time of, of being really backslidden again, back into alcohol and drugs and sexual immorality and all that. And, uh, you know, he taught me just what a wretch I am. And it's all by grace. And uh, I had nothing to do with it. And he, I'm one of his sheep and there's nothing I can do about it. You know, he said, my sheep, you know, he knows who they are and he holds them in his hands and nobody can pluck them out. And I, by his grace, I just happen to be one of his sheep. And then as far as the Bible version issue, I was not always King James only at all. Um, you know, I tried a New American Standard, and I tried several of them. And one day, one guy handed me a book by uh, Gail Ripplinger, and it was New Age Bible versions. I thought, oh, you know, they're all the same. There's nothing to it. And I started reading it, and I began to see some things. And because of my Eastern religion background, it kind of hit me, too. Some things started to stand out. Still wasn't convinced, but I started reading uh, then the other side. I read D.A. Carson, and I read James White. And I read all of these guys, a lot of them. Uh, James Price, I read his book. So I read both sides of the issue, and I prayed a lot about it and studied. And I came to the conclusion, uh, if you're not a King James only Bible believer, then you, by default, do not believe that any Bible in any language you can show us is the complete and inerrant words of God. Mm. And that's just a fact. Um, that's one of the questions that Bible agnostics, that's what I call them, because they don't know for sure what God said. But you ask them, you know, do you believe that any Bible in any language, including the Greek and the Hebrew originals, is now or ever was the complete and inerrant words of God? Can you show us a copy of it? And almost inevitably, they refuse to answer that question. Mm. And, you know, the, you're your own authority if, if you don't believe uh, that the King James Bible is the final authority. I believe God worked in history, 
and he really did complete uh, his promises. He fulfilled them, and we have an inerrant words of God in the English text of the King James Bible. I really believe that. And one of the things, you know, you can go into the manuscript evidence, and I know quite a bit about that. I, I post on it all the time. I know that all the texts and the the, the science science of uh, textual criticism. And I, I know all about that stuff, but it's, it comes down to truth. It's not a salvation issue. I don't believe that only King James Bible believers are saved. You know, I believe that the gospel is found mm -hmm. in any Bible and any language, no matter how incomplete or corrupt it might be. And God can save his people through reading any of them. So that's not the issue. It's mm -hmm. not a salvation issue. It's a truth issue. And what I found is that some very serious theological errors in all of the other versions, and that's what really helped convince me, is once I began to see, you know, well, some theological error, something that is just totally not true, I can reject that as being the inerrant word of God. So I kept doing that more and more. I'd find one and here and one over there. And the, at the end of the day, there was only one Bible that stood out that, was, that remained, and that was the King James Bible. And so I have uh, several articles on, you know, what I believe are theological truths that are corrupted in all of the modern versions to one degree or another. So I am I'm a King James only, and that's what I mean by that. Now that's that's really good, Will. And I'm just going to show your site here. So if people don't know where Will Kinney's site is, it's recently been changed from uh, Google Webs to just brandplucked.com. And so if you go to brandplucked.com, uh, you'll come to this site and you've got a whole list of uh, KJV articles. So 1 John 5, 7, Jehovah, Lucifer or Morningstar. You've, you've got Easter. This is the place where for many, many years I've pointed people to when they say, where should I start? I say, we'll go to Will Kinney's site and just start searching around there and it'll definitely either give you the answer or, or it'll trigger a whole bunch of uh, thoughts and study and send you in the right direction there's you're prolific there's so many articles here and yeah <laughs> th this is uh so when are you going to write a book will do you think you're uh, going to put this into no. book format no i'm too old and uh yeah no what happened is that used to be webs.com and then they closed down they shut mm. The, the, my site used to be on webs.com and then uh, yeah. they sold to somebody else and canceled out like hundreds of websites and mine was one of them. Mm. So another brother kindly helped me and he set up this site. I can't really go in and edit it. So if there's a typo or something like that, or some of the links don't work okay. like, you know, I can't really change that, but he uh, has updated uh, a lot of things. I had an article the other day that had totally wrong link and he fixed it for me. It was on, uh, mm. Thou shalt not kill Deuteronomy 2013. He fixed it for me. But yeah, so there's thousands of hours worth of uh, study and labor that, that went into making that. And uh, I think most of it still stands as far as uh, I understand it. Yeah. So, I mean, there's yeah. a lot of good material there. Yeah, absolutely. And this is one of the first places that I will go to if I'm doing a study. Um, because usually, like, if we just click on any any link here so say it's um uh second samuel that we'll we'll just have a look at this usually you've got the issue immediately that's you a might... example of theological error in these new versions yeah mm. that's one of them i mean that's that's a big theological error yeah and um and usually uh, like i'll i'll um be debating with um you know, people who are against the King James, and I'll show them a page like this. And oftentimes they'll fight against me and say, oh, Will Kinney, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, really what it is, is usually there's only 10% of your opinion there. And the rest of it is commentaries. Mm -hmm. It's other Bible versions. It's all right. the facts, stats, and figures. So I don't really understand why there's a big fight against what you're saying. They might disagree with your opinion there. But really, it's got you know, John Wesley, the John Trapp commentary. It's got um, a whole bunch of other Bible translations. So you've done the due diligence to 
to defend your position. It just seems like people want to have an ad hominem argument against you and just reject reject what you're saying and try and make it like, oh, well, that's Will Kinney. You know, that's um, you shouldn't listen to him. He's a King James only cultist. You know, he's he's off the wall. And so that's what I've found anyway. When I when I cut and paste links like this, most people um, who are contras will just go, oh, well, you're going to Will Kinney, are you? And then they sort of shut off. We, there's so much information here that um, I, I think anyone who would go to your website would be, at, they would at least know your position and the King James position on any any one of these issues. Yeah, can I address that when I, because I get that a lot, you know, that uh, King James Bible believers are, are a cult. Because mm. this is how I respond to that. You know, I've met uh, hundreds of King James Bible believers over the last few years, mostly on Facebook. But I mean, I've talked to inter and interchanged with hundreds of them. I think I, in that time, I found maybe four, perhaps five, who thought that only King James Bible believers could be saved, you know, which mm -hmm. is ridiculous. I mean, it's just absurd. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, there were lots of people saved, you know, back in the times of Tyndale and the and Great Bible and Bishop's Bible and other languages, the Reina, Reina Valet and Spanish and then Diodati and Italian and the Gospels found in any Bible. Mm. So that's not the issue. Um, and the only thing is that, you know, we're not adding anything to the Gospel. I'm not saying, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ plus the King James Bible and thou shalt be saved. No, that's not what I'm teaching at all. The Gospel is still there. I'm not adding anything to it. And uh, you don't have to be a King James Bible believer to be saved. So if I'm a cult because I believe that God worked in history to actually give us a complete and an inerrant Bible that we can hold in our hands and read and believe every word, if that's the cult, then does that mean that you, the guy on the other side, who don't believe that there is any Bible in any language that you can show us that you believe is the inerrant word of God, you're therefore orthodox? Is that how it works? Mm. Of course, I never get a reply to that, <laughs> but uh, that's how I, I treat that that issue. You know, they've got to feel better about their own unbelief in some way. So they they come up with these ridiculous charges. You guys are idolaters. You're cultists. You know, and that way they can feel better about where they stand. So, so can you define for us what a Bible agnostic is? Well, it's interesting is that uh, actually in one of Bruce Mesker's articles, one of his students, he, he referred to himself, he said, we need to be a little agnostic in regards to the science of textual criticism. He used that wow. word. That's amazing. Yeah. And actually agnostic, all it means is not to know. You don't know. Mm -hmm. and so, like an example, like uh, John MacArthur. Uh, he's got an article where he's talking about... <laughs> He talks about the, the inerrancy of scripture, and then he gets to a section in, in one of his papers, and I've got it, I've got an article about him on my website, and I got the access, a link to the paper that he wrote and everything. But he comes to uh, Matthew 6:13, where it ends in the Lord's Prayer, they usually call that that. And it says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And John MacArthur says, we don't know whether he really said this or not. There are some manuscripts that, that have it and other manuscripts that don't. That's a Bible agnostic. Mm. Classic example. Um, yeah. James White is another one, of course. I mean, he says, you know, I believe the Bible is inerrant. He'll say that. Mm. But if you ask him to show you a copy of it, he'll mm. never do it. And like James White, for example, he thinks that uh, Luke... I think it's 2334 where it says, uh, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Mm. It says that's not inspired scripture. It doesn't belong in the Bible. It's in every Bible that in existence. But James White says that doesn't belong in the Bible. It's not inspired. And he's another agnostic. You know, I mean, he's, he's his own authority. Mm. And I believe anybody who's not King James only is their own authority. You know, what they think should be or should not be in this, this Bible thingy that they sort of believe in, but they don't think is inerrant. So, yeah, that's a Bible agnostic. Mm, no, very good. And 
So just back to back to your life, Will. Um, so you studied um, to become a Spanish teacher. Yeah. And so you you were in South America for for quite a while, and you yeah, learned six States. years. Yeah, I was in six years and lived in South America. I was in uh, Colombia, and then uh, for about a year and a half, and then I was in Ecuador for another four and a half years. And I've been up and down through Central America several times in Mexico, and I was in Spain for a while. But yeah, primarily I was in South America and uh, I learned Spanish, of course, in school. And then I got fluent in it when I was down there. I had dreaming, dreamed in Spanish and I thought well, Spanish. And when I came back to the States, my sister said I had an accent <laughs> when I spoke <laughs> English. But uh, I love Spanish. It's a great language. It's beautiful. And the people down there are just wonderful. They're most mm -hmm. For the most part, they're really nice people. And Yeah, so anyway, I, I taught Spanish in high school the last seven years of my career. And then I retired. No, that's really good, and I think it's um, it's it's very good because um, a lot of people have been critical of you, you know, modern uh, text critics, most probably because you've been one of the loudest voices on the internet, and you've come against you know James White and James Price and and some of these other ones who spend like Rick Norris, they write you know so much, uh, Doug Kudelik, these guys. When it, you, just to read one of their articles takes hours, you know, let alone you know, just to try and figure out what they're getting at can take a long time, let alone to refute it and to pull it all apart. Um, but the thing is, you you uh, you know languages. You, you've studied Spanish. You're fluent in Spanish, which is um, yeah, a lot of these other scholars haven't got that type of skill set to be able to uh, understand um linguistics like you do so i think um you know a lot of the criticisms against you have, have just been ad hominem attacks just trying to throw you under the bus because what you're saying is really pertinent and very powerful against the critical text and against the um the people promoting that and so um just while we're on the spanish issue what about the spanish bible like this um the um Gomez edition and the Trinitarian Bible Society have just brought out a, a Spanish edition and I've, I've seen some articles online where they say oh don't go with the Gomez that's like a King James only type of edition and um, so what which one would you say recommend as the one of the better ones um, and which one is probably the closest to the King James yeah, I'm not familiar with the Trinitarian, the, the recent one. I, I don't know what that's about. I haven't seen okay. it. Okay. Uh, but I know the Reina Valera, Spanish, mm. the most common in, in Latin America and Mexico is the Reina Valera 1960 edition. And there are some problems with the Reina Valera. There's a guy kind of behind it named uh, Eugene Lida. And, mm. uh, who this changed. And so they've came out like there's a 1909, there's a 1960, 1977, 1995. And now they, I know they came out with a 2015 edition. And each time they continue to remove TR readings and they'll interject, interject critical text readings. And, and it just gets worse and worse as it goes on. Mm. And so there are more and more deletions of words uh, in the Reina Valera. Um, you know, I believe that God, God holds us only accountable for what he's given us. And, you know, to whom much is given, much will be required. So, I mean, if God, what I recommend for Spanish people or any other language is just get a, a, a Bible in your own language, but that is as close as possible, follows the same text, the same Hebrew text that doesn't reject, like ESV and NIV and NAS, they reject the Hebrew uh, Masoretic text in many places, uh, and add to it, add hundreds of words to it, especially the ESV. And um, but get a get a text in your own language that's as close as possible to the Hebrew Masoretic text and to the the Texas Receptus, the Reformation text of the of the King James Bible. Uh, for me, the best Spanish Bible that I know of, I would say, is the Reina Valera Gomez Bible. Mm. Uh, it's it's quite good and. I've written to him a couple of times where I, I found something I thought that were errors or mistakes well, and things. And yeah, and he's written back to me and he's corrected a couple of them. And I don't know the man very well, but I know that he's willing to to look at things and consider mm -hmm. them. And 
for for my part anyway, and I would say that uh, Reina Valera Gomez is the best Spanish Bible that's out there. Okay, no, that's that's really good. And so, what about other language Bibles? Um, and so, a, a lot of people say, like, say someone like uh, Matthew Vachier from Bible Protector. He's here in Australia, and I've I've I interviewed him maybe two years ago, and we had a chat. And um, but he says that people should learn English to get the correct word of God. And so, what are your thoughts on on that? No, I don't. I don't agree with that. I, I've heard that view before, but that's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of work. A lot of people even know English don't have a trouble with some of the words in, in the King James Bible or any Bible. I mean, I've got a list. Usually, they'll come out with, uh, "Oh, it's archaic," you know. And well, there are a few, very few words that are archaic. But uh, even when they criticize them, they know what they mean. And you know, as far as the, the these, and you know this, and, and other Bible believers do, but the thee and the thou and the ye, those reflect the actual underlying Hebrew and Greek texts, and they're far more accurate than the generic you. Mm. And, uh, but no, for somebody who speaks say, Spanish or Swahili or Chinese or whatever, I don't think they have to learn English. Um, I think they just Try to get the best Bible that they can in their own language, because uh, that's what's going to hit you home most is your own native language you were born in. And there's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of truth in all Bibles. You know, they're not all totally corrupt. There's still truth in them, but I think there's a lot of areas of corruption, particularly in the modern critical text versions. Mm. Just theological errors and uh, that are mm. quite obvious. Not just textual. I think most. Errors that I found are theological; they're not they're, they're translational, rather than mm. well. Yeah, and that seems to be something that not a lot of people realize because we, we we seem to be all familiar with the fact that there's a different Greek text, and so that affects um, translation. But there's a lot of redefinition of terms like yeah. monogenes and oh yeah, um, yeah. So. It, I can give a great example of one if you want to see one. Uh, I'm not, yeah, absolutely. Let's see, bring it up here. Yeah, it's in Titus three ten. Okay, it's where yes. heretic or a divisive person. And this is a good one. In uh, the King James Bible, and it says a man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Well, the ESV, the New King James, the NIV, New American Standard, Modern English Version that supposedly is TR and it's not, the Net Version, they say, as for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He's self-condemned. So the difference between a person who's a heretic and a person who causes division. Well, the Greek word, it's not a textual thing. The, the, the Greek here is the same in all, all uh, versions. It's all Greek. It's hieresis and hereticos. In fact, right here is hereticos. That's exactly the word that we get heretic from. That's, it sounds like heresy. And if you go into what heresy is and they begin to divide, excuse me, you begin to define what heresy is. I mean, it's, it's false teaching. Look up the word heretic in any English dictionary. For example, here's Webster's. Okay, a person who professes a heresy, especially a church member who holds beliefs opposed to church dogma. Uh, heretic. We got one who holds to a heresy, one who believes some doctrine contrary to the established faith or prevailing religion. Uh, here's a Greek dictionary that I have that has nothing to do at all with... Uh, with the Bible issue. It's just a Greek dictionary, like uh, you were to get a Spanish English dictionary on, on the internet. And you can type in, and I got the link there in the article, but type in the word hereticas and we'll come up heretic. And if you type in the word English heretic and that will come up in Spanish, this exact word, hereticas, that's what it means. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of this, but as far as what uh, the Heres, heretic here is also that you've got, uh, this is the Latin Bible, Wycliffe, Tyndale, Coverdale, Matthew's Bible, Geneva Bible, 
uh, the Dewey Reams, Visa's translation, Mace's, Whiston's, uh, John Wesley's translation, Worsley, Webster, Pickering New Testament, Longman Version, Hewitt. There's a bunch of them. English Revised Version, okay. Uh, commonly Received Version, Alfred, even him, uh, Darby. I'm skipping over the Bashida, uh, Lance's translation of the Bashida. God's First Truth, Thompson New Testament, Green's Literal Translation, Jubilee Bible, Far Above All Translation, 2011, a whole bunch of them. I'm skipping over a bunch of these. Mm. Uh, they all say a heretical man or a heretic. Um, but even in foreign languages, you get into the Spanish, uh, Las Sagradas Escrituras, you got the Hombre Hereje, uh, the Spanish Reina Valera, uh, Gomez, Hombre Hereje, it's a heretic man. Uh, the Polish Bible, yeah. Heretica. The Russian Bible, the Italian Diodati, Uomo Heretico, a heretical man. Um, French Martin, uh, French Osterwald, okay, they read L'homme Heretique, okay. So, I mean, that's what it means. But when you get to the New King James, it says reject a divisive man. Mm. Here's the problem with that. If you're to reject the divisive man, we're going to end up rejecting Jesus Christ. That's right. Because you come down, I'm skipping down a bunch of this stuff because I go over I go over some of John Calvin's commentary and I go over John Gill. They all describe this as a heretic. And that's that they're they're commenting on Titus 3:10. B.W. Johnson Bible, he does the same thing. Adam Clark, he does the same thing. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, they all agree the word here is heresy, and they talk it's a doctrinal perversion. Okay, so when you get down to, let me scroll down here. Tino Gropi brought this up, this good example about the, the Kool-Aid, you know, the, the great Kool-Aid and all that stuff. Um, anyway, let me skip down to the part here. Okay. Oh, yeah, here we go. Okay, here's why it goes against Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 25, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, and then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Mm. Luke 12, 51, suppose ye that I, Jesus, am come to give peace on earth, I tell you, nay, but rather division. John 7 43 so there was a division among the people because of him Jesus John 9 16 therefore some said of the Pharisees this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day others said how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles and there was a division among them John 10 19 there was a division therefore again among the Jews for these sayings Jesus so Jesus was and continues to be a divisive man but he was not heretic. The King James Bible tells us to avoid heretics. The modern versions, including the new King James, tell us to avoid and have nothing to do with the divisive man. And if we follow the logic of simple words, this would include Jesus. So yeah, that's a heretical, That you know, it's a doctrinal error. And it's mm -hmm. in the same text, but it's the way they translate it. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Very recently, a new poll came out that tells us the majority of modern Christian leaders do not believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God. At a discussion forum that I belong to, a brother posted the, the following poll. He says, I was listening to my radio today and happened to catch Pastor Michael Yosef's message on leading the way. And uh, here's what the poll revealed. 85% of students in, at America's largest evangelical seminary don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. 85%. Well, 74% of the clergy in America no longer believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And he says, if the above stats are even close to being accurate, then the Church of America is in sad shape today. That's very true. And uh, there, here's the, the flack that you'll get that you talked about that I get sometimes. I was in a Christian forum, and I posted about this, how the vast majority of uh, Christians no longer believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. And when I defended the King James Bible as being the providentially preserved, inerrant, 
and inspired words of God. This is what one of the moderators in this forum, I'm directly quoting from him, that he didn't believe in any Bible. He actually called me. He said, you're an apostate, an idolater, like Satan, causing confusion and divisiveness. Hmm. Mockery of God's word, following a myth and a master of deception. Oh. So that's what he had to say to me. <laughs> so, you know, if he thinks it's heresy to believe in an inerrant holy Bible, is it orthodox then to believe there is no such thing? Hmm. <laughs> it's it's quite amazing because these people actually think they're doing the will of God because they look in the Bible and it says to, to reject the divisive, divisive man. man. Exactly. And so we would be considered as divisive. Right. And so that they rightfully, according to their Bible, reject us. Exactly. But inadvertently, they reject Jesus as well. And anyone who's ever caused division, Moses and David and pretty much everyone in the Bible has caused some sort of division. And like, look at Solomon, the first bit of wisdom that he had was to, you know, say, carve the baby in half. Discernment means to decide between two things. Mm -hmm. So pretty much anyone who is causing any type of division between truth and error is to be rejected according to the modern Bibles. Yeah. And exactly what you're saying, this is not a textual issue, but this is a translational issue, yeah. which is quite amazing. Yeah. And there are a lot of things like that I found in, I mean, a lot there. Are most of these theological errors, they're translational, not textual. Well, that's a really good example, Will. And so um, what what do you think of the label King James Version only? Do you wear that hat or do you try and shake it off? Or No, I don't I don't mind at all. I'm, I'm, I say that I'm a King James Bible only believer. That does not mean that only King James Bible believers are saved. I do not believe that at all. And I resist that. Anytime I hear it, I see it come up at all. Um, but I believe that only the King James Bible is the complete and inerrant words of God. And it is the standard for all others. Uh, I've, I've looked at a lot of foreign languages. I don't know all of them, but a lot of languages I don't know. But a lot of languages I can pretty well make out or... I can find through Google Translate and things. Mm -hmm. I've never found one that I honestly believe is totally 100% pure and inerrant. Mm -hmm. There are some that are very, very good. And if that's what God has given you, well, then go with it. But, you know, stick with the best Bible you can because there's a lot of truth in it. You know, it's not all error. There, like I mentioned here with heretic, there are a lot of foreign language Bibles that translate it uh, as a heretic, as a heretic man. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so they're not all messed up. You know, there's still a lot of truth in them. So, that, yeah, but I'm, I would say I'm King James only. I don't know of any other Bible that is inerrant, 100% true mm. yeah, than this Bible. Yeah, that's and that's really interesting. And I think, um, like I often say to people, even if the, the translators had done all their work and they were all German-speaking people and did it all in German, I would probably go, well, that's where the words of God are in the German language, and we should update our our English Bible to match that. I would agree. Um, and, yeah. So uh, what do you think of um, Textus Receptus only? And what would you say is the difference? Because um, some Textus Receptus guys will say, well, I'm not King James only. I'm not a KJV guy, but I'm a TR guy. What would you describe the differences between those two positions? Well, usually when I hear that, then I ask them which TR, because as you know, I, there are probably about different 29 different varieties of it. You know, they're all basically the same, but some of them are, are you know, some parts, they're quite different. Mm. For example, Stephanus, and uh, I think it's Romans, Romans 10 in, in uh, Scrivener and uh, Eleazar and Beza's text, uh, it'll say, uh, serving the Lord. In Stephanus it says serving the time. Now, that's not the same thing. You know, it's a different reading. So I mean, there are there are different TRs out there, and I ask, well, which one? And if they finally identify, which they usually do, is Scrivener. Well, Scrivener's wasn't composed or written until 1894. So I mean, it was long after the King James Bible was here. And basically, what he did is he back translated from the King James Bible 
into Greek, trying to determine whether they think they use Biza, which they usually did. Uh, Biza's text of uh, 1598, or Stephanus, which was second, and then uh, or uh, Erasmus, which they only used third. And um, he missed a couple of spots that I know of, like he missed the Amen at the end of uh, Ephesians, the very end. Uh, but if you're TR, well, then you become still the final authority because how are you going to translate it? You're not preaching to your congregation in Greek because they wouldn't understand what you're saying at all. So you got to translate that in order to communicate. And then you, again, become the final authority on how you're going to translate it. And again, that's where I find most of the theological errors. Mm. You know, a really good example of that is in 1 John 5, 19, uh, where it changes radically. On, you're looking at the same text, but what you come up with is very, very different in meaning. And so there are several uh, sections of Scripture that are like that. You know, that at 1 John 5, 10, uh, 19 says, uh, for the whole world lieth in wickedness, King James. And a lot of others. The uh, NIV says the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Well, that's a theological error. The whole world is not under the control of the evil one. Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Uh, God says, the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. So if you're to come out and say that the, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. That's a theological error that just goes against a whole mm. lot of the scriptures. And yet they're using the same the same Greek text, but it's the way they translate it. Mm. Yeah, and um, and that heretic example is is just gold for showing like because the the reading there the New King James is claiming to be you know the Texas Receptus yeah. and for the most part it is. For the most but it's part. exactly the same Greek there. All right. It's just how they translate it. And yeah, that's where the errors are found. So, and I mean, so, it's not just a textual error. You know, people can argue text all the time, but if you start to see, wait a minute, these are truths that you can compare Scripture with Scripture, and, and there's no contradictions in the King James Bible. Theologically, there are no contradictions. I don't believe there are any contradictions. Mm -hmm. There's some apparent ones, and they can be resolved. But theological... Uh, contradictions, those are tougher to get around. You know, if you if you're if you're unbiased, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of guys just dig their feet in and they don't care what you show them. You know, they're going to resist it. But mm -hmm. uh, if you're open, you know, to learn the truth and compare scripture with scripture, and you really love the truth of, of the Word of God, it should be obvious after a while that no, there's something really wrong with a lot of these versions. Mm -hmm. And so, um, usually. I, I usually um, come to the conclusion that most King James or TR people, whether they're KJV preferred or whatever their label is, they go, well, the text of Scrivener is like the fi their final authority mm -hmm. or the text of Beza is the final authority. But one of the things I've been saying for quite a few years is the underlying Greek text that never really got printed is is akin to the originals would you agree with that will uh, you said it never got printed in a sense where it, it it's not exactly oh, they did, oh i see you mean the king james uh, translators themselves did not put out a greek text is that what you're yes saying? oh yeah that's true yeah yeah and so would you agree that the 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 english here um, that would, like Edward Hill says, it sort of creates its own textus receptus. Right. And that if, if we were to get that those exact Greek words, like Scrivener attempted to do that. He did a pretty good he, job. He did a good job on it, yeah. There's a few bits here and there. but yeah, um, So you would say that the Greek underlying the authorized version would be akin to the originals that were penned. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that God did preserve his words. You know, they say, well, wait a minute. A lot of these confessions, you know, Westminster Confession and Baptist Theological Confession, everything that came out, they came out after the King James Bible was here. And they talk about God preserving his words in all generations. I do believe that. You know, I'm not denying that. I believe that God did preserve his words, but they weren't all gathered together into one book. Mm. If you take their other view, they're trying to push 
then the, there would have to have been a, an inerrant and perfect Bible before the King James. And so I, can you show me one of those? And they never can, of course, because they, they all differ from each other. They differ from the King James, and they certainly differ from the modern versions. They were a lot better than the Vatican supervised text versions like the ESV and the NIV and the New American Standard uh, and the modern Catholic versions. They all agree because they're all based in the Jehovah Witnesses, a uh, New World Translation. They're all based on the same ever-changing critical Greek text, and they come right out and tell you that. Mm. And so they're quite different uh, the uh, textually from the Reformation Bibles, which you'll find in you know, all the previous Bibles leading up to the King James Bible or other foreign languages like uh, the, the Spanish Cipriano de Valera or the, the French uh, Olivetan or Martin Bible or uh, the Italian Diodati. Those are Reformation Bibles. So textually, they're going to be very, very similar. Those are the best Bibles, usually your older ones. Mm. And, and so what do you think of the influence the Roman Catholic Church has on the Bible? And um, what are the dangers of um, Catholics being involved with Bible translation projects and the United Bible Societies and things like that? Well, uh, it's interesting, uh, that, that question and how, how people would look at it. You know, I think... Of course, the Catholic Church, I don't believe it's a true church. I think it has a lot of false teachings, but yet there's enough kernel of truth in some of the things they do teach that are good. And I, I've known some Catholic people, not very many, but I've known some that I really believe honestly love the Lord. And uh, they, they believe Christ died for their sins in spite of what the Catholic Church teaches, not because of it. So I'm not saying all Catholics are lost. I don't believe they are. But most of them, for the most part, you know, don't really know the Lord as, as well as a lot of Protestants and don't really know the Lord. It's just kind of a name only. Uh, but the, the Roman Catholic Church, since the very beginning, was in favor of the critical text. Uh, one of the leaders, translators on it was uh, Carlo Martini, you know, was mm. a, a Jesuit cardinal. He was in line to be the Pope, but he, he died before that. But... Uh, uh, and Westcott and Hort themselves very much favored Rome and the Romish uh, views of several things. And, and uh, so, I mean, it's had this Romish uh, influence all the way along. And uh, right now, they come right out and tell you on page 45 of their uh, 27th edition. Let's see, do I have it right here? Let's see, that's the 20, 27th or 28th. 27th, page 45, let me just read, it's not very long. Uh, yep, here it is, so this is the, right, right here, it's a, it's a critical text, 27th edition. <coughs> it says, the text shared by these two editions, talking about UBS and United Bible Society and the Nestle of Lund, was adopted internationally by Bible societies and following an agreement between the Vatican and the United Bible Societies, it has served as the basis for new translations and for revisions made under their supervision. This marks a significant step with regard to interconfessional relationships. And then of course, is it inerrant? Well, it says, it should naturally be understood that this text is a working text it is not to be considered as definitive, but as a stimulus to further efforts toward defining and uh, verifying the text of the New Testament. For many reasons, however, the present edition has not been deemed an appropriate occasion for introducing textual changes. Of course, they are, they're already working on the next one, the 29th, and they plan on introducing quite a few textual changes. But they come right out and tell you that there's an agreement with the Vatican and it's under their supervision. Mm. And uh, that's just the way it is. And that's, that's, those are the Bibles that they're using. When, it was kind of interesting as I had a conversation with Francis Turretin, <laughs> not very long oh, yeah. And I brought this up, and I thought his take on it was quite interesting, how he flipped things around. Is that he said that, uh, well, uh, the Catholics, have, you know, we finally got them to agree on the Bible. You know, what Bible should be using? It's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> no, 
I think they got us to agree, not, not that we got them to agree. But I thought it was interesting how he flipped that thing that around. So that's kind of how yeah. people see things. You know, you see it or you don't. And if you don't see it, then you make up excuses for it. And it seems it seems like um, the more because the Roman Catholic Church is just becoming so liberal, it's almost like the Mormons. You, you don't you can't even define them anymore. They're so strange. So the more liberal the Roman Catholic Church has gotten, then all of a sudden they agree with the Protestant text. You know what I mean? And so you would think the more orthodox they're getting, then they go, wow, this is the new text the Protestants have. We're going to jump in and grab that text. But it seems like the more liberal they're getting, uh, the more stranger they're getting, then they're like, oh, yeah, we'll adopt the Protestants' text as well. So it's not really actually a good testimony for the Protestants that the Catholics grabbed their text and are using it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, they're not the ones who actually, you know, because Carla Martini was one of the main editors on the on the Nessa Lalan UBS text, the UBS mm. text. And uh, oh, it, it's been the Catholics all along. And no, um, the Bible talks about the horror of Babylon, you know. Yeah. And all the old reformers, you know what they thought that was. And, but yeah, and look at American churches. There are churches all over the world, but I mean, America particularly. I mean, have we gotten better? Have we gotten stronger, uh, more orthodox? Look at some of the weird things that go on in a lot of churches. And a lot of the churches are shutting down. Mm. And uh, I mean, hundreds, I guess, every month or something like that. That's what I read somewhere. That hundreds of little churches all over the place are, are just closing down, closing the doors. And you get these big mega churches. And you look at, you know, Joel Osteen or things like that. You know, it's like, come on, is that Christianity? Yeah. And, a lot of these weird things that are going on. That's just, I don't think the church has gotten better. We don't have better Bibles and we don't have better churches. No, not at all. Yeah, exactly and, right. The Bible tells us, you know, in the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And, um, perilous times shall come. Many shall depart from the faith. And these are, there comes a great falling away. So that's what the Bible tells us is going to happen. And, you know, I believe we're in those times. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so I'm just going to um, mention a few critical text people and some majority text names. Um, what are your thoughts on James White? Well, James White and I've had a couple of, I've I talked to him on the phone. I talked to him one time on the Internet quite a while. And we butted heads, and then uh, I had a telephone call with him one time. And you know, he's in control of the program, so mm. he cut me off. I mean, made it sound as though I hung up on him, and it wasn't that way at all. He hung up on me, yeah. but he wouldn't answer my question. You know, he says he believes in an errant Bible, but I asked, Can you show us a copy or at least tell us what, what it's called? What's the name of it? I mean, he wouldn't do that, and he just went off on well, Bellini introduced all these, you know, textual changes or all mm. the changes. And, which King James Bible, you know, Blaney didn't introduce, he didn't change the text at all. He updated some of the spelling and that was about it. I mean, he didn't change the text. Yeah. But James White, you know, I, I, I think that he's the, the Vatican, the Pope of the Vatican versions. You know, he's the new Protestant Pope mm. of the Vatican versions. He really promotes them. I don't think, that the man is unsaved. I think he actually is a Christian. I've seen a couple of his testimonies. And in spite of all that, I don't think he's a horned devil. I, I think that he's mistaken. <laughs> but I, I I think he's a brother in the Lord and ultimately he's gonna he's gonna be with Christ like I am. And uh then know the truth. So I mean I don't hate James White, but I think mm -hmm. he's totally wrong. So what about uh James Price, the old testament editor of the New King James? What do yeah. you know about him? I've read his I've read his book. Uh, it's a new what is it? Uh, King James version, a new heresy or something like yeah, that. Yeah, a new cult, I think it was. Yeah, something like that. I, I've read his book, not very good. And uh, you know, the New King James changes a lot of places in the Old Testament, uh, which Hebrew texts are following. I've got examples on that, a whole article on the New King James. It goes on and on a lot of examples. Um but again, you know, he's another guy who is his own authority, who has no inerrant Bible to give to anybody. And, um, you know, the New King James, when they 
originally started the translation, they wanted to more go towards the critical text. And, uh, but then they decided, well, no, we better stick, you know, for the most part with the TR. They don't always do that. But again, it's just another guy who's his own authority, you know, and has no inerrant Bible to show to anybody. Mm. Yeah, I'll just show people a picture of his book there. King James Onlyism, yeah, a new sect, yeah. which is just I, another word for a cult. Right, I read that one, yeah. Wow, okay. And so um, so what about Doug Kutelek? You've, you've um, written quite a lot about him. What are your thoughts on Doug? Well, you know, again, Doug's another guy just like that. Uh, again, his own authority. And he and I used to write each other every once in a while, and then he kicked me off because <laughs> mm -hmm. I started, you know, criticizing some of the things he was saying. And uh, again, you know, we have an, I have an article, I guess it's by him, on uh, Psalm 12, uh, the, mm -hmm. the provision of the words of God. So there's one of my articles where I deal with him and what he said and then what I said and how I'd respond. And uh, again, he's just another guy who's his own authority. And that's what you find out there is every man for himself, Bible versionism. That's what we have today. Everybody's an authority. Uh, everybody thinks they know best how to translate this part or that part or if, if this should be in the scriptures or not. That's what all these guys are about. Yeah, so Doug's, I, I just found this site. I have, I've never seen it before, but yeah, he's got his own articles but you've written you've actually written quite a lot answering all these um all these issues that he's brought up online and so it's quite amazing that other people um on the other side of the fence can be quite prolific also in, in writing about the septuagint and writing about um you know things that we we would uh, be critical of lucifer and yeah he's he, one yeah, I see that, the son of the gods yeah where he does that one yeah that's, yeah it's coming that's a common one and so i'm just looking on your site because you you answer um doug's yeah i do yeah here we go doug cutelix anti uh, preservation in psalm 12 an email exchange with doug cutelix right um psalm 121 doug cutelix in the new king james so a lot of these things have been answered by yourself, which is which is really good. I read your email one. Well, most of these articles I've read because I've had to put them on my website um, back probably you know fifteen years ago, and so I had to go sort of through them and and just sort of proofread them and put them in the in the correct place on my website. So every now and then I'd be like, oh, he's answered Doug Kudelik, and I'd just read through the article. And it was it was really good stuff um i found but um so what are your thoughts on rick joiner i don't know much about rick joiner i've heard the name uh i don't okay. know much about, but i imagine he's just like all the other guys yeah absolutely and um so mark ward thoughts on mark ward mark ward yeah i do know about him yeah we we invited him to our king james uh uh bible debate uh, somebody somebody started the club on facebook king james bible debate and i don't even know who started it and one day i got an email and somebody just put me in charge of it and said here take it <laughs> mm. so that's where i've been and we invited him to come he said he would come and he had something special to, to show us and then uh, he just backed out but i have responded i've got an article about mark ward and, and i've seen several of his videos and he he tries to diminish you know the the amount of just textual differences mm. and uh you know though they're really not that important you know they don't really change that much actually if you count it all it comes to about well there, you got at least 17 entire verses you got about 41 entire verses that are either called into question or just omitted and if you get a anybody can go on google and just go um uh westcott and hort magic marker Mm. I'm sure you've seen it. That's gold. Yeah, but uh, just Westcott and Hort magic marker. Just Google it, and it'll come up and show you what's missing, you know, in comparison to the King James Bible and in comparison to the critical text. And you'd be amazed. There's a lot missing. And <clears throat> so he tries to minimize all that. 
And he's actually a, a critical text Vatican version promoter. He doesn't really believe in any Bible as being the inerrant words of God. And of course, you know, the theological errors, he just won't deal with those. Uh, I mean, I, I, I bring stuff up and he just, uh, if I answer one of his videos, he just deletes my comments. So man, that's been going on for a while. So I can't get anything across on his videos. But I'd love to take him on if he'd come and, you know, King James only debate or whatever, you know, on our Facebook or in a video. I'd love to, you know, talk to him. The guy doesn't understand English even. <laughs> Some of the things he criticizes, he just doesn't even know English. Yeah. Uh, something's an error in the King James Bible. Well, he just didn't understand what it meant. But, mm. And I noticed in his latest video, he was saying that King James only readers are missing out because they'll read over something and there might be an archaic term. And it's a bit like when you miss the point of a joke, you, you can't laugh at it. You have to have it explained and it ruins the joke. And he's saying, well, if you're reading the King James, it's got archaisms in it and you miss the point. You miss that precious moment where you're going to um, get it. But what about all the deleted words mm -hmm. wouldn't people yeah. go through and they they can't read the story say for example of the angel stirring the water right 42 words are missing so they don't get that either and so yeah it just, his videos seem very strange and very contradictory yeah he is uh yeah i think there comes a point when god turns a person over to a reprobate mind and they just can't think straight and uh there are a lot of just clear theological errors in all these Bibles. And what would Mark do with Mark would do with those? What are you missing? You're missing the truth that's just easily seen if you just have eyes to see and compare scripture with scripture. But yet again, yeah. No. Yeah. Um, one of the th one of the verses that I often go to with Mark Ward is John chapter five, verses three and four, where he's worried about this word halt here, that it should be translated as as lame. But he's saying that's a false friend. But what about the 42 words that are deleted just after that? What about the missing friends? They've been abducted. They're gone. They're, they're, right. they're no longer there. But the, he wants. To, he's worried about Holt. So he's straining at a gnat, yet he's swallowing a camel. That's another case where he doesn't know his own English language. All you got to do is look up the word in a dictionary and see what it means. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, and if one leg has stopped, which is what, you know, halt, you know, usually the German, you know, halt, you know, stop. <laughs> if one leg is stopped, then you're going to be limping. All right, you know, you, exactly. It's, yeah. it's pretty basic stuff. But I think because he tied himself to this in his first book, he's bringing out another book this year, um, He's he has to keep defending it. And strangely, he gets hundreds and hundreds of comments on his YouTube videos mm -hmm. saying, well done, brother, you're the oh, best. Yeah. I've seen it. <laughs> it. It makes me wonder if these are Chinese robots or something, <laughs> or if the church is really that bad, you know, it makes yeah. me wonder. Yeah. Yeah, there was that one he, he just couldn't understand. I think it was a verse in Job about uh, that Job beforehand was as a tabret, a drum. Yes, yes. And he wanted to change it to the, the I'm just one that, that spit in his face. And he couldn't mm. understand what a tablet was or what the verse meant. He was just befuddled. And it's like I got an article, and I don't know if I even have it on my site, but I, I have the article that I've made up. And uh, the King James is absolutely right. Uh, that's what it, the Hebrew word means, a drum or a, a tablet that's a small drum. Mm. In the fourth time, Job was like an example that uh, they marched to the beat of his drum. You know, They followed his example, and now they reject him. But the new King James and others say, well, now they spit in my face. Mm. I don't know where they came up with that. But, you know, Mark and I got commentaries that agree with the King James. They're showing what it means. You know, John Gill and others and a whole bunch of Bible versions that translate it exactly the same way as it is in the King James Bible. But he doesn't understand the verse. And so he thinks, well, it must be wrong. And he mm -hmm. comes up with this weird, you know, alternative. So, no, I don't really have a whole lot of respect for Mark Ward. Yeah, yeah. And have you watched many of the Textual Confidence Collectives? He's brought out two seasons now. I've just seen parts of a couple of them. I mean, it's like 
you know, I can only stand so much of that stuff because it's <laughs> it's just repetitive. Each guy's mm. an authority and oh, he's so smart and intellectual and you know, no, I, I just really can't handle a whole lot of that. Yeah, and so I've only got a few more names here on the on the <laughs> contra side. So what about Dan Wallace? What are your thoughts on Dan? Ah, uh, let me bring it up if I can here a second. What Dan Wallace is his own words. This is pretty interesting. Let's see. Let's get rid of that. I don't want to lose you. Where do I have close? close. I'm going to bring up his own quote. Oh, here it is. Okay, I'll click on my little. I got a little on my screen here so if you come up here Dan Wallace because I don't think this is a, yeah it is on my site under the I had an, a whole article on Dan Wallace yeah here it is Dan Wallace what he really thinks about the New Testament this is a direct quote <clears throat> he says we do not have now in any of our critical text text critical Greek text or in any translations exactly what the authors of the New Testament wrote. Even if we did, we would not know it. There are many, many places in which the text of the New Testament is uncertain. That's a direct quote from Dan Wallace. So that's where he's coming from. Yeah, there you are. Thank you, Paul. You know my site better than I do. <laughs> I go to it quite frequently. Yeah, I mean, that's just right out of his mouth. You know, that's what he said. Again, he had more. You know, scholars are not sure of the exact words of Jesus. Mm. So that's where Dan Wallace is coming from. And, of course, he's a critical text, you know, versionist. And he rejects the Hebrew readings in many places. And surprisingly, sometimes he'll actually differ from the others and follow the King James, but not very often. Yes. But he's, he's his own authority, you know. He, him and James White have that... Um that battle over father forgive them for they know not what they do it seems uh -huh. dan wallace supports the verse where james white wants it deleted uh -huh. okay which is which is pretty interesting you'd think they'd be on the same page you know they're both textual scholars and um but they can't i mean we're, we're over easter time and people are talking about the seven sayings of jesus well i guess you better delete that to and, and change yeah. it to six sayings of Jesus. Yeah, right. Yeah. I think that that mm -hmm. verse, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's in the majority of all verses. I believe it's in Sinaiticus as well, but it's just mm -hmm. not Vaticanus. So, I mean, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus differ radically from each other over 3,000 times just in the Gospels and then about 1,000 times in the rest of the epistles. But, I mean, some of them will have, like synaticals, will have whole verses missing that are found in Vaticanus and vice versa. Mm. Uh, uh, you brought it up. You got all this stuff there. Yeah, amazing. But um, yeah. anyway, uh, yeah, you really know my site far better than I do. I mean, you can find <laughs> things easier. So, well, uh, I, I just want to put it out there that if, if there are any tech savvy people who want to help Will and the guy who who is um doing this site if they want to go through and you know help with this or if, if will's written any new articles and they need proofreading or anything like that you know, jump on will's side um will does a lot of very good work and you know one of the one of the main things that i've used this website for is when i've we've been going through the urdu new testament and so what i would do is any any scripture that we were looking at i would type it into um the trinitarian bible society's list of um deleted words and added words i type it into skyon of zion because he has a quite a fair list of uh, added and deleted words and i type it into will's site and oftentimes will was the only one on the internet who had pointed out that there was a difference in the majority text or in the um critical text and so i i we would go through that in the modern um uh, Urdu Bible, and we would see, yes, this has been changed there as well. And so it was very helpful in updating the um, the Urdu Bible to become uh, a TR-based, uh, King James-based um, edition. And so that's why I, I use your website so frequently, because I'm 
going through searching for verses like this and searching for changes and you've done all, all this homework it's it's an invaluable resource yeah, well, thank you um so i won't even ask about peter gurry or um the csntm i guess you're probably going to say very similar things um about or what what do you think about the csntm the work that they do with i don't even know what that is <laughs> that's the center for the study of new testament manuscripts dan wallace <laughs> runs that website where they scan in all the um oh, that's dan wallace. oh i have yeah. heard about that yeah well the same thing that i just said about dan moss that what he says himself it's all these guys are the same it's every man for himself bible originism yeah what about the majority byzantine text position with people like maurice robinson james snap jr pickering pierpont what do you what do you think about the majority text movement? It's a little bit of a different horse there yeah if if you actually scroll down to the very bottom of my on my site on the left hand side that was one of the last articles i wrote was uh on the problems with the majority text view it's on the very bottom of this keep going right there it is see on the left hand side very yeah. good so yeah there's a whole article i have about it and wow. so anyway that might be helpful but i mean again there are two, there are at least two varieties of quote majority text you know and they're slightly different from each other um and uh Again, you know, they're, they're more like the King James Bible, but not always because there are some whole verses that are gone. And then they have readings in them that nobody nobody adopts, uh, critical text or Byzantine or anybody. Mm. And then, uh, again, it's the same thing as where you become your own authority and how you're going to translate it. And there was really no Bible that was printed, as far as I know anyway, that followed the majority text until fairly recently. Mm. They've come out with a couple of different versions. And uh, it's just a, you know, just another one that's out there that I don't believe is inerrant. Uh, if you want to use it, okay, you'd be closer. It's better than the critical text versions, but no, it's it's not the inerrant words of God. So I'm going to mention some names of King James defenders, TR guys, and and can you just share with me some of your thoughts on these people? What, what do you think of someone like D.A. Waite and his position? Well, as far as I know about uh, D.A. Waite, I have read his book, or at least one of his books, and uh, I actually talked to him on the phone one time. And he's more of a, the Hebrew and the Greek than he is the English of the King James Bible, and he'll allow for certain mistakes what he thinks are mistakes in the king james but he always appeals finally to the hebrew the greek and how he thinks they should be translated so that's kind of as far as i know about him that's what i, I think he's coming from mm. and what about the dean bergon society what what, do you, what are your thoughts on the dean bergon society well i've read uh, the re, you know the original book by dean bergon about the revised version and all that re, reversion reversion re, revision revised and uh, he had some very good stuff in it but he was not king james only mm. you know there were certain parts that he thought he thought it was the best english bible that's out there but uh, he thought there were some problems with it and some little phrases that maybe shouldn't be there so i mean you know again he wasn't uh you know he couldn't show you an inerrant bible he's still working on it so but i mean a lot of good stuff at least he criticized a lot of the stuff in the critical text versions that was quite good yeah absolutely yeah that's that's a really good answer and i usually try and tell people that bergon started the majority text movement um by sort of advocating for the traditional text and not the textus receptus um that a lot of majority text guys go to bergon and use his principles and come up with the majority text, which is, um, it, it does seem strange that DA Wake called his society the Dean Bergon Society. Because they weren't King James only. <laughs> yeah. And so it would have been better to call his society maybe the Texas Receptor Society or something like that. You know, it would have been a bit more accurate, but right. it has caused a lot of confusion because people go to Bergon and then he says, I don't defend the Texas Receptus. And they're like, well, what's going on here? You know, it's, yeah, right. it's strange. 
Um, what are your thoughts on Edward F. Hills? Yeah, I read his book too. Um, I thought it was quite good what I read of it. And uh, he, like he said, that the, the King James Bible is a, is a variety of the TR. Hmm. And uh, what I read of him anyway, his book, I, I think I've only, I've got two books by him. I like both of them. I thought they were quite good. I don't know much more about the man, but. Uh, no, I, that's good. And I don't expect you to know know some of these names even, but I'm going to throw them out there just in case you have a bit to say on them. So what about uh, Matthew Vashur with uh, Bible Protector here in Australia? Any thoughts on him or don't really know much about it or? Well, I, I appreciate the brother. I mean, he's, he's a strong uh, King James Bible believer and defender. And, uh, that's about all I want to say, really. I mean, we probably yeah. don't agree on everything, but I mean, I, I appreciate his stand on the King James Bible. And so there's been a lot of new guys uh, coming forward in the confessional bibliology camp. Um, do, do you see this as akin to what you believe and what you're thinking, or do you see differences um, between yourself, your position and their position? What's coming out of them, you said? Uh, the confessional bibliology. Oh, no, but you said something's coming out of them. What was that? Um, like their their position. Like is their position uh, similar to your position, or it, would you say that there's um, like hardline distinctions there, TR only or whatever, and your King James only? Would would you say there's much of a difference between yourself and say people like Jeff Riddle and? Uh, Peter Van Cleek and um, other guys in the confessional bibliology camp? You know, I've seen a little bit of them and, and Jeff Riddle and uh, not a lot. I mean, I don't I don't watch all these videos, but I've seen enough, at least I think to, I, I kind of know where he's coming from. I think we're in the same ballpark. Uh, but like I said, I am solidly English text of the King James Bible. I believe mm -hmm. that is the final authority. I wouldn't change it in any way. Um, you know, it was here long before I was born and it'll be here after I die. It's this, my final authority. I had nothing to do with it. There it is. I believe God worked in history to give it to us. And for many reasons. So that's where I stand. You know, if somebody else is uh, more or less in the same ballpark, which I think those guys are, you know, well, I, I would tend to agree with them. But if, you know, if I ask them, can you show me a copy of an inerrant Bible? I don't know if they can do that. I'm not sure. Okay, and so what about um, people like Stephen Anderson, Gail Ripplinger, um, Peter Ruckman, people who are a little bit more controversial, um, you know, according to uh, some people. What, what are your thoughts on, on these guys? You know, I don't, I'm not quite sure why you're asking me these things. That, I mean, I can tell you, you know, I don't, it, like Stephen Anderson, you know, I agree with him on some things, some things I definitely do not agree with him on. But he, he's good on the King James Bible issue. I think he's really good on that. You may not agree with him, but I think the guy is actually quite entertaining. You're not going to go to a sleep, at least. I wouldn't go to sleep during one of his sermons. You know, the guy brings up some really good stuff. He's a very smart guy. He knows uh, several languages. He knows Greek very well. Uh, I don't agree with him on his views on the Holocaust or some other theological things. Uh, with Gail Ripplinger, I actually talked to her on the telephone two years ago when we talked for a while. And a very nice lady. Okay. And I agree with her views on the King James Bible. Um, but I think on some of her quotes, she kind of misquotes people and sometimes takes things out of context. And, uh, um, you know, so there are little problems there. And uh, mm -hmm. who was the other person? It was uh, Peter, Peter Ruckman. Oh, Peter Ruckman. Oh, whew. No, I'm I'm definitely not a Ruckmanite. Um, there were a lot of things wrong with Peter Ruckman. Uh, I liked his views on on the King James Bible for the most part, what I read of him anyway. But he he was a racist. I mean, a flat out racist. Uh, he had some really goofy, wild ideas on things, and I theologically I would not agree with him on many things. But so no, I'm definitely not a Ruckmanite. Um, you know, and, and, no, that's kind of where I stand on that. Mm. And so, just just one more question about uh, another person. Do you know Do you know what happened to Scott Jones? He had one of the best 
um, websites on the on the internet that I love to read and study and go through, and then it disappeared. Um, do you know what's happened to Scott Jones? I don't know what happened to John, Scott Jones. I do know who he is. Years ago, probably 15 years ago, we were in contact. I had just a weird thing happen with him. The guy is really smart. He knows Hebrew and Greek. Uh, mm. He's, I mean, he really knows his languages. And uh, we even agreed uh, theologically on a lot of things. But he got to the point where, you know, you can tell who's saved and who's not. <clears throat> and I said, you know, brother, I, I, I can't always tell. I mean, there are people that I know are Christians. You know, I have, I know my wife's a Christian. I know uh, several of my friends. I know they're Christians. If they're not a Christian, I'm not, you know. Some people I just don't know. You know, they kind of, eh, you know, you're not really sure their testimony is that that's strong. Are they really walking with the Lord? There were times when people could look at my life, you know, and say, man, that, there's no way that guy's a Christian. But I was. And uh, we can't always tell. And he thought, because I couldn't tell always who was and who was not a Christian, that maybe I wasn't a Christian. Mm. And uh, he kind of broke off fellowship with me. And I thought that was kind of weird. Mm. So I, I don't know, but I haven't heard from him for years now. Okay. Okay. And so um, so apart from um, that, what who were some of your favorite um defenders of of the truth of the bible in bibliology king james are there are there certain people that you go to that um like I, I go to your website a lot and people say you know where should i go i go well kjvtoday.net um brandpluck.com there's a bunch of websites that i usually guide people to what, what about yourself do you do you have like books of people that you just keep going back to and it's like a gold mine for you I honestly don't do a lot of reading of other stuff. I mean, I, I, I do my own kind of research and study. You only have so many, you know, so much time in the day. And this is not my whole life. It's it's my passion. I love it. But, you know, I have other things to do. But as far as guys that I, I respect that, you know, are a strong King James Bible believer, I would say you are. And and John Word is on, on King James uh, debate. He's very good. Um. There are several guys, you know, that I think do a really good job defending the King James Bible. And so you're one of them. So. Oh, great. Well, I've copied most of your material. <laughs> so it's um, plagiarism. So you're actually <laughs> you're actually commending yourself there, Will. <laughs> um, so, so what advice would you give to people who are studying this issue? Um, like what are some time wasters that you, you know you've been down all of these rabbit holes you know defending the king james for years what what are some time wasters or or maybe if you don't have any answers for this because it's a it's a it's an interesting question or what are some shortcuts that help you like do you have bible uh software or do you like oftentimes i would go to scott jones's site and copy and paste things i'd go to your site copy and paste things do you have any shortcuts or things that could be advice that we could avoid um, time wasting when we're when we're defending the King James and Texas Receptors? Well, I, just generally, what I do is if I run into a verse or somebody brings up a, an example of a different reading or something, you know, I, I do have the Greek books here. I have the critical text editions, and I have the majority text, and I have the uh, Scrivener's TR, and but not everybody knows how to read Greek, and so um, that's that's a good starting point. Though, and then you can there are sites on the internet where you can look up uh, the different Greek readings and, and where they <clears throat> where they occur. There are several you know New Testament sites, Greek New Testament sites, and I like the version sites where you can compare uh, different Bible versions. So there are several of those. So I use those quite a bit. And uh, that's what I use a lot in my own study is just comparing different versions, seeing how they read, who agrees with the King James and who differs and why. And uh, but a lot of it, you know, is just, you know, through prayer and, and the Lord help me understand, you know, guide me and teach me the truth and uh, don't let me be led astray. And I don't want to lead others astray. 
And yeah. uh, just, you know, God, I think, has given me this desire just to, I love doing it, you know, and I love God's word by his grace. And uh, I know what I was without it and uh, what a mess I was. I'm just so thankful for what he's done in my life and put it back together again and the, the wife that he's given me and just all the blessings that I have. So, yeah, I owe everything to the Lord Jesus Christ for his mercies to me. No, that's that's very good. And and so you, know, you study the Bible a lot. And um, has there been any unexpected discoveries or revelations in your research that you've you've found um, that have altered your understanding on a particular topic? Like I, sometimes I'm reading through your material and I'm like, I don't know anyone else who's seen that there. It's like I'll, I'll search the Internet and, and it's like you've gotten a a revelation because you're studying in depth something like in you know in a the book of malachi or something like that it's like wow you've you've come up with this understanding let's say with easter um that was a big thing for me to turn me from new king james to to the old king james because mm -hmm. um articles like scott jones articles like yourself showed that easter was in its correct semantic range it was after the resurrection <clears throat> words like unicorn um things like that are, are there any other are there things that you've discovered over the years that have been sort of profound for you well there is one area, but I don't really want to get into it because it just opens up a whole bunch of stuff. That, That's fine. Uh, it has to do, if anybody cares to look at it, <clears throat> there's an article on my site about justification and what does justification mean. I, I think that a lot of people misunderstand how the term is used. Because uh, So you might be interested if anybody wants to see a, a very different view than one normally presented. Uh, it's on my site there. Mm. doctrine of justification so that's in i've noticed that this section here when i first started looking at your site uh -huh. you had maybe two or three articles on uh calvinism right but but now it's you've been writing lots on the issues of calvinism and the king james version and how other bibles change things and so you know obviously that's that's your um particular position and so you're going to defend it and um but yeah on on wheel's site you'll notice that the top half is sort of like basic bible um version issues and the bottom right. half is to do with calvinism versus um arminianism correct right i'll just go to that um doctrine of justification here yeah you don't need to go through it but if, if somebody cares to get into it because i think what it actually means is we're we're justified by several things. We're justified by faith. We're justified by our words. By thy words, thou shalt be justified. We're justified by works. Uh, <clears throat> there are several things. We're justified by his grace. Justified by his blood and his blood that he presented in heaven. I think what justify means, just shortly, is it doesn't mean to make righteous. It means to show to be righteous. When a, a person, I go through a bunch of verses in scripture, but even in, in uh, everyday language, if you say, well, you're trying to justify your position, mm. you're trying to show why it's right. Now, you're not trying to make it right. You're showing why it's right. And I think that we were made right at the cross. All of God's people were made right. You know, he was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And that occurred at the cross. And once that transfer of righteousness has occurred, well, then we're justified by faith, means we're shown to be righteous by faith. Uh, when it says that uh, wisdom is justified of her children, well, wisdom is shown to be right by what it produces. Hmm. So you have to be right in order to be justified. So you actually being right, then you're justified. And so we're justified by Abraham and, and uh, Rebecca or uh, Rahab. They were justified by works. Now, they weren't works of the law, <clears throat> but they were, Abraham, what did he do? He offered up his son. And uh, Rahab betrayed her country or her own city. But mm -hmm. what they did showed that they believed in the true God. 
And so I don't believe there are any contradictions in it, but I would say that's one of the revelations that I've had, that just reading through the Bible and thinking about it. It's something that I don't bring up all the time, but if people would like to read the article and think about it, you know, I think I think it's the correct view that, you know, Jesus Christ made us righteous at the cross, but we're shown to be righteous by our works, by our words. My words show what I think about Jesus Christ. By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just a different view that I present for, you know, you don't have to believe that way, but I think it's the truth. No, that's, that's, um, that's very interesting. And so... Um, Another question: How many how many hours a day would you say that you give to this particular topic? I'm really not that many anymore. I mean, I'm older now, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe well, I mean, I'm I'm on the internet quite a bit with Facebook, and uh, maybe a couple hours, you know, spending in, in the Bible itself, reading the Bible on my own. Just uh, I go through the entire Bible. You know, I have sections where I split it up in three different sections, and I Every day I read part of the Old Testament, either Psalms and Proverbs, and the New Testament. And I've been doing that for years. Mm. And then I'll, you know, somebody will bring up something on Facebook, maybe an alleged error or whatever, and then I'll go in and start looking at it. You know, so it can be one or two hours, maybe a day. That's it. Mm. And so looking back on all your studies and everything. Um, is there something you wish you'd done differently um, or projects which you wish you pursued a little bit more? Like say, um, like you said you learned Greek, um, to learn Greek. Do, do you sort of wish that if you could go back in time and talk to yourself, you know, 30 years before and say, hey, well, you're going to be um, one of the main guys defending the King James in the future. What, what would be some of the things that you would really wish that you could tell yourself, like to learn Hebrew maybe or something like that? Or are, are any of these things you wish you'd done a little bit differently? Well, looking back over my life, there are a lot of things I wish I had done differently. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I believe God is in control of my life. I, my, my times are in his hands. Mm. And uh, he has each of us, you know, where he wants us. He's going to teach us the lessons that he wants us to learn. He's conforming us to the image of Christ and showing us along the way our need for him, just how weak and, and sinful we really are if we're left um, on our own. And so, I mean, I, I think God is in control. And it's certain, my life certainly hasn't turned out the way I planned it or thought it would. But, I mean, he knows better than I do. And... So I, th I think he's equipped me in the way that he chose to do so. And so, I mean, I really can't say, well, you know, I wish I'd have done this or that differently as far as preparation goes. A lot of things I wish I hadn't done when I was younger, you know, but mm. that's so, uh, how God teaches us. So what about for people who are um, coming up in the ranks and they're, they're wanting to defend the King James and the TR, what advice would you give to them? What what would be a good thing for them to learn or to get under their belt? Like like you're reading some of the people who are writing stuff on the internet. Is there something in you at times that goes, I wish that this person just knew this one thing or these two things that would really help their position? I think uh, uh, probably a good thing to learn. It would be a good thing to learn Greek. Um, I learned Greek because I wanted to defend the King James Bible. I wanted to find out what was what it really said, or because I'd hear sermons. Well, the King James doesn't really get it right here. The Greek doesn't say that. And with what little I knew, I could look up. Oh, wait a minute, he's referring to a different Greek text, and he's telling mm. that the King James is wrong, and he yet he's following a different text. And so, once I you know I started to learn some of the basics. Uh, about Greek. I'm not an expert in it, but I mean, I can read it, and I have several books, you know, that help me along the way. Um, I started seeing, no, wait a minute, the King James is right. And so I think you can defend the, the King James Bible a little better if you do happen to know or at least have a pretty good knowledge of, of working knowledge of Greek. But I'm not a Greekophile, you know, I'm, I'm a, I, that's not my final authority, it's the King James Bible. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, and a lot of us is just you know believing God. You know, do you believe this book? 
uh, God promised it, you know, and he's a God of truth. He cannot lie. And so if you find something that's a lie or blatantly false in some Bible version, you know, well, that's not it. That's not the one. Mm. So keep going. And the only one standing at the end of the day is, in my opinion, the King James Bible. Yeah, no, that's really good. And um, so, so what are your thoughts on Sinaiticus being a forgery? What are your thoughts on that? I'm not really sure. I, I've heard uh, Mr. Daniel's uh, views, and and he actually sent me uh, his books, and I, I've read through them. You know, and it very well well maybe. I don't honestly know. I, I, I James Snap, I know disagrees, and uh, so there are different views out there. So I don't really take a strong stand one way or the other. I just go into what they actually say, mm. Vaticus and versus Vaticanus, and then regardless of how old they are and that they're corrupt. Mm. So that's, that's the position usually I take on it. And so James White says that we're afraid of textual variants and manuscript evidence. Um, are you, what are you afraid of? Will? why are you so uh, afraid of so ridiculous? Not afraid of that at all. James White would be afraid of the things that he says sometimes. <laughs> uh, the guy's totally inconsistent. You know. Mm. Yeah, and I watched that phone conversation that you had with him where he just seemed to cut you off and talk over the top of you. And um it was it was quite um revealing. It he he doesn't seem to converse with people, he seems to bully oh. them and talk over the top of them. Yeah, he was in total control of that program and uh he tosses things at you if he'd you know, that's why I like, you know, I have debates sometimes on, you know, not very often, but I enjoy them. But I would like people to send me, well, what are your examples of you think are error? Because what James White and others like to do, they ambush you, like to toss something at you that you probably don't know or never heard of before. And you look like an idiot because you don't know how to defend it. Mm. So, okay, so give me your examples of what you think are error. And I have a couple of debates that, that are going to be coming up here in a couple of months, I guess. And uh, so I need a list of these errors, and let's take a look at them. So let me know what they are as you see it, and then we can discuss them. So that's the only fair way to do something like that. Yeah. What do you think of the um, the phrase, don't trade truth for certainty? Um, or how do, how do they word it? You've, you've, trade traded, <laughs> you've traded your... Um, your certainty for truth or something like that. It's a Dan Wallace sort of quote. Yeah, what they're, well, what's implied in that is, in their view, what is truth is that there is no certain Bible. Mm. There are no certain words, as he says himself. And he thinks that's the truth. And so if we're certain that the King James Bible is the word of God, well, then we're the ones who are wrong. And so we've traded truth, his truth, which is there is no inerrant Bible, for the certainty of having one. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> Just flip things around, you know? So no, I would definitely not agree with that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it says in Proverbs, I'm just gonna quickly Google this, certainty um, and truth. I think it's in Proverbs three or something like that, where it says- Certainty of the words. Exactly. And so it's, the, the words are certain. And so, um, and thy word is truth. And so yeah. um, they, they're they just playing um, word games, semantics, mm -hmm. really. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. And so before, we got a few questions from the audience. And so, um, but what's the what's the future for Will Kinney? Uh, glory, death and then glory. <laughs> Amen. A new body and I'm not going to sin anymore. I'm going to see my Lord. Yeah, you'll get an angel's body. That'll be good. Well, some bodies. I sure don't want to go to heaven in this body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've always wanted an angel's body, so it's going to be great. Yeah. No, you know, I, I have no idea. It's boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day mm -hmm. may bring forth. So I don't know as it lies ahead, but uh, except in the far future or whatever it is that I'll, I'll be with the Lord. I believe that. And, and I'm going to see his face. And so we've got um, four questions so far that I'm going to um, throw at you from the audience. Okay, and let's do a few questions and then we'll we'll wrap it up. I think that's probably good. But yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so Dwayne Green says, um, do you see the Reformation as a stamp of approval on the TR or the KJV? Yes, I do. Okay, that's very, very easily answered. Um, okay, so someone asked where is the Will Kinney website, so I'll just um, I'll throw that into the mix, so everyone can everyone can go there and check it out. There we go, brandplucked.com. Whoops, that's better. And so Terry O'Neill, uh, he's recently become very interested in the King James issues. Uh, he said, what's the problem with the new King James? I have uh, an article on my site. If you go there, it's in the left-hand column, probably about a third of the way down, and it's titled something like, is the new King James the inerrant word of God? You have got to be kidding. And uh, I have, a, that's my own study, a lot of stuff. There it is. <laughs> I have a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> <laughs> to, you're not you're not trying to uh, win friends and influence people. <laughs> well, influence people. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of things wrong with the New King James, and so I go through a whole bunch of them. And uh, so, no, it's not as bad as the critical text versions like the ESV and stuff, but uh, it's not good. That's a very good answer. So, yeah, I'd recommend people go to that, and I've just thrown that link into the into the mix uh history document says uh will what are your thoughts on the vatican and their influence i think we actually talked about that yeah. Yeah. so um yeah we've, we've already answered that so a hannah says uh what are you, your thoughts on the italics should they be retained um are the rules kind of disjointed or should it just be the same font Well, the way I understand it, I mean, uh, all versions add words uh, to the text. You have to. In fact, the Hebrew and Greek themselves often are elliptical languages. And it, like an example in English would be, been there, done that. You leave out your subject, part of the verb. Well, Hebrew and Greek do that as well in many places. And so the italicized words in the King James Bible show places where they put words in to help smooth out the sentence or have it make sense. There are places, like several of them in the Proverbs, that if you don't put the word not in there, you end up saying the exact opposite of what you're supposed to. So I have an article again on italics, the use of italics. But all versions, uh, ESV, NIV, they all add all kinds of words, but the, a lot of times they just don't put them in italics so you don't know if they're added or not. So I would keep them. I'm, you know, I'm not going to change the King James Bible in any way. And uh, I believe the italics are part of Scripture. Uh, and I give several examples of that in my article on uh why italics yeah, so that's in there uh, it's also on my site and just look for it but i give several examples of where what's quoted say in the old testament and, and part of it is in italics is quoted in the new testament but no italics because they actually put it in there in the text so it's part of scripture hmm. um and so from a hannah again he's just got a few questions here uh should the archaic words or some idioms in the KJV be updated for better understanding for people. So I guess idioms like God forbid, I guess, and, and things. Yeah, God forbid is totally accurate. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it all. It's in fact a lot better than uh, the way the lot may it never be. That sounds kind of effeminate. But God forbid is exactly what it means. Is this what does the phrase mean? And and I show some Greek experts and who actually speak Greek and they say that's the best translation of it. And I think you have an article on that, too, or something, I think, Nick. But uh, archaic words, you know, there are a few. But you can learn the meaning of those. There are words in all, like the NIV, New King James. There are a whole bunch. I have a vocabulary test for both of these with a list of a bunch of words that most high schoolers would have no clue what they mean. And yet they're found in the easy-to-read NIV and New King James Bible. And if you go into any realm of study, you know, uh, medicine or art or uh, cooking, you know, mechanics, uh, car repair, 
uh, computer, anything, you're going to have to learn certain words that are new vocabulary. And sometimes, you know, a word might mean something in one context and another in another. Um, so, you know, there are just a few, there are only a handful of words in the, in the King James Bible. And usually when people bring them up and criticize them, they know what they mean. So, no, I don't, I don't think that's a problem at all. I wouldn't change anything in the King James Bible. That's great. And so Ahan is asking about the Septuagint. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. on the Septuagint? Uh, it's really corrupt. I have a whole, I, you just brought it up. There are a lot of guys who, not just King James only, but uh, others who, what passes for the Septuagint today actually comes from Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and Alexandrinus. Mm -hmm. And these are written long after the New Testament was already complete. So that's why sometimes uh, they might mask the New Testament more so than the Hebrew, because they came after the New Testament was already complete. And I have several scholars here that, that have talked, uh, John Gill and, um, oh, that uh, he wrote the book, on John Owen, John Owen's on uh, Hebrews, and um, several of these commentators who mentioned that you know, they took things out of the New Testament and put them back in the Septuagint. And so these aren't King James only, you know, people who are saying this. There are several different versions. I think there are just a lot of independent uh, attempts at translating Hebrew into Greek. And, uh, but it has a lot of problems, the Septuagint. So I'm, I don't believe it was legitimate. I don't believe Jesus quoted from it when he spoke in the, in the New Testament. He spoke to Paul. He spoke in, in Hebrew. He said in the Hebrew tongue. And he went on. So I don't believe that he was speaking in Greek, uh, using Greek, quoting Greek at all. So anyway, something to consider. I know it's a big controversy on, on the Internet and everywhere else, but no, I don't think it's legitimate. No, that's really good. And I know you answered this in the recent Turgeon fan debate that you had. Um, but what about uh, satyrs? What, what oh, do yeah, you think satyrs. they are? Satyrs. Yeah. I wish I, ha I had a, well, I have an article about satyrs on my site, but I have a lot more on my own uh, article that I expanded on and went into it more where I showed even more modern versions that use the word satyr. But I explained what a satyr is. It depends on how you define it. And uh, Mr. Turretin was defining it in one way and several other Bible commentators and Bible dictionaries define it in a different way. It's sort of, sort of a, demonic being of some kind that resembled a goat and there are several people in fact some modern versions translate it as a goat demon but you'll find the word satyr even in the new american standard uh, 2020 edition so mm -hmm. and a few others as well modern versions and so i've got an article yeah uh satyrs dragons there you go yeah you know my site far better than i do <laughs> and uh how to get around it but yeah anyway uh satyrs is correct yeah, it depends on how you define the word. But we have saners, satyrs, we have cherubims, we have seraphims, archangels. There's a whole host of different uh, angelic and demonic beings out there. Okay, so Dwayne Green um, is in the house and he says, question for Will, what do you think of those who espouse mathematical proofs of the King James Version? Do you think numerology has a place in your view? I think it can go too far, but I think there are some uh, mathematical coincidences. I don't think they're coincidences at all that are found only in the King James Bible that cannot be duplicated in any other. And they just seem to testify that, you know, these are like God's fingerprints on the King James Bible. So I have one article. I bring up several of the uh, mathematical examples that I think are quite valid. And um, I think it's just another proof of, of the, the absolute truth of the King James Bible. But I think it can go too far. And I don't think it's numerology. I'm not trying to predict the future or anything. Uh, I'm just pointing out something that is factual that you can see for yourself in the King James Bible, the English text. And see, so they'll come back and say, well, wait a minute, the verses weren't numbered, you know, back then. Well, no, what you see is God's continual preservation and protection of his word through history. All the Bibles now do have those numbers in them. And I, I believe this is by the providence of God. And the interesting thing is you'll see in a lot of the new versions like the NIV, ESV, and New American is 
they'll come along to a verse like Matthew, oh, six, I don't know what it is, 1920, for example, and then they go 1922. Well, wait a minute, what happened to, you know, the one in between? Mm. And uh, so they've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. You know, they're testifying a silent testimony. There's something there that they don't measure up to. That or they, you know, they need to take a remedi remedial math class somewhere. But no, there's the numbers, I believe, are by God that he did that in history. And that's the way we have our Bible today. I don't think God has given up watching over his word. I think he continues to do that. No, it's very good, Will. And I think we've um, we've asked all the questions there. <clears throat> and so you've got a couple of debates coming up um, on Standing for Truth's channel. Yeah, right. So you're debating PJ James. So I debated him maybe three years ago, I think it is now. I saw the video. Uh, yeah, Donnie sent it to me. So I, I learned a lot from it and what to watch out for. He laid some ambushes for you. Yeah. He passed a couple things at you that... Uh, you know, one of them I'd never even heard of before. And so, anyway, I'm ready for him this time. <laughs> and uh, who else are you debating? You've got PJ uh, James. Another guy. Um, oh, I have his name. I have it right here. I, I might look it up. Um, Day, let's see. I've never heard of a, this brother before. But Daily or something or other. I'll just go to Standing for Truth. He might have these lined up here. Um, His name is Daily Reese. Daily Reese. I don't know who he is. Yeah, I've, I haven't heard of him. He calls himself Daily Reese. And so he's given me seven examples of what uh, he thinks are errors in the King James Bible. So we're going to look at those. Right, okay. Yeah, I can't seem to find that immediately, so I'll just leave that. Actually, yeah, it's it's coming up though. But yeah, I enjoyed the Turidan fan debate, and I've debated Turidan a few times, and so it's been fun. Um, and we're we're looking at hosting some debates on this channel as well, and so we've got quite a few people interested. And so, um, yeah, maybe we can have you um, back and do a debate or. Uh, even just discussing just like one thing sure. might be good as well. Yeah, be glad uh, because I know this can be quite daunting and mentally exhausting because I'm asking you so many different questions. And so I know it can take a lot out of you. But um, but I really appreciate you coming on the channel and, and giving us your point of view. It's um, It's been very good and very informative. And so... Um, and so, yeah, I think maybe we can um, finish it up there. We didn't go for five hours like we did with Joseph. <laughs> no. But um, I think people are more inclined to listen, I think, to a shorter one than one that goes on and on and on. But that's yeah. just me. Yeah, some of these live ones, they're going for like five, six hours. I'm like, I, I, I didn't uh -huh. think I had it in me to do that. But, but yeah. Um, yeah, so a lot of people are saying thanks. Uh, Joseph Armstrong, Bible version conspiracy, saying thank you, Will. History documents, God bless. Uh, Nick and Will have a wonderful Easter. Thank and you. Um, and you can use that word Easter. Go and buy some. Amen. Amen. Go and buy an Easter egg and eat it just to break <laughs> that religious spirit. <laughs> um, thank you, Will. Um, Terry O'Neill, he's saying, yeah, he wants to see some of Will's debates. So you can go for. If you type in Standing for Truth, um, I've done a few debates on that channel as well, and um, you can find those. But uh, I think we're going to end it there. So it's been uh, great. And if you've got any last words, Will, for everyone. Well, I just really appreciate you uh, letting me come on and talk about these things. And, you know, I, I just hope the Lord opens up the eyes of more of his people to the fact that, God really has fulfilled his promises to preserve his words and heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And uh, it says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Mm. And so God is a God of truth. And as you go through the King James Bible, you're going to see absolute truth all the way through doctrinally uh, in every way. And, um, uh, 
so I hope that, you know, you just see that and it makes such a difference in your life when you say, I really have God's word here that I can read and hold in my hands and believe every word. So may the Lord open the eyes of more of his people. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks, Will. We're going to shut it down now. So thanks, guys, for joining us. And we'll see you next time on Revolution. Okay. God bless.